Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask, that God, that as you transform and change lives, you continue, Father God, to build into our lives the Holy Spirit, that which you want to do in our lives, and even, Father, the things of your kingdom. And thank you for doing all the miracles and healing of the physical bodies and souls here in this dimension, in these end times. But even more, Father, we know it's important to prepare your church and your bride for New Jerusalem. That ultimate place that you want all of believers to be. We ask, so, Father God, that you continue, Lord, to speak your word to our lives and to do a mighty work in us, so oh, Father, that we may grow and be established fully in you into the fullness of your spirit. Let your perfect will always be done in our life and be glorified, Father, in all that you're doing. Thank you, Father. We give you all the glory, worship, and honor for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. 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 Let's go. We continue from uh, where we left off on uh, predestination and pre-existence. Uh, there are some things that uh, I want to talk about in some of the recent downloads, but I'm waiting for certain things and certain timing. Uh, and then it will be released, uh, and it is an awesome thing what God is showing. But uh, let's continue uh, on the Word and teaching the Word to prepare our lives uh, for that which God has for us, and uh, predestination and pre-existence. Now let me take you from where we have, uh, where we are today. And, uh, okay, I'm going to synchronize. Okay, okay, this is synchronize. There we got it. Okay. And where we are, and I'll draw a new chart so that we know where we are moving from. Okay, I use that first to draw three colors, so I need three colors. Okay, let me do the red one. And um, we have A, oh sorry, I got to write first, let me do the ABCs, A, oops, okay, uh, wrong one, let's see, where's the pen, okay, that's A, uh, B, and C, and um, This is the one. Under A, we know that's God's predestination. Okay, predestination. I do it as a red line. Predestination. And then I'll use a different color. Let's get, um, yeah, purple will be fine. And I use a purple line for free choice and uh, this will be part of what our topic is today and let's see another line yeah I still need to design a dark green and this dark green line for uh, I use theta for God uh, God's uh, intervention. Now where we are today, uh, there's a first chart, there are two charts I'm going to work with. Uh, where we are today is to realize that A, God predestined us. And uh, I will just uh, mention the scriptures without turning to them. In Romans chapter 8, we know that God predestined us. And uh, whom he loved, he predestined. And then uh, he foreknew us and he uh, has called us and chosen us to be glorified with him. We are all predestined. Uh, chosen before the foundation of the world. And you add Ephesians chapter 1, uh, there is definitely the predestination because we haven't come to earth yet. And he chose us before the foundation of the world. Chose us to be in Christ. So predestination is uh, named Psalms 139, that before we came into this earth, there was a book written. 
about all the details of our life. This is God's perfect will, God's predestination. Now, predestination is actually not just, uh, it's based on uh, two areas. One is this individualized thing. But how does He predestine us uh, in that? Uh, what takes place in uh, predestination? Let's uh, get back to color again. And uh, it is mainly under predestination are events. Events. And uh, so there is a predestination of events which is beyond any individual. Then what we're not covering here. Because those are major events. What God plans to do uh, in revealing human history. He does predestine. He did predestine that Jesus will reveal himself. And uh, whether plan A takes place or plan B, which we are, we are in when Adam and Eve fell, we can plan B. Uh, God never planned for humans to fall. You cannot say that God designed them to fall. Cannot. Because it's inconsistent with uh, God. God plans for man in his original plan that if Adam and Eve did not sin and they continue to grow and grow in the Lord after whatever number of years, thousands of years, God still planned to reveal Christ. Perhaps in a different manner, perhaps in a different way, we do not see. But uh, with the fall of man, the event of the revelation of Christ still takes place. And uh, then the, the event of Jesus coming still takes place. And the event of New Jerusalem glory would have still taken place. These are major events that God has uh, designed into our lives, uh, into, into the human race. When the human race was first called and chosen, those are major events that would take place. With plan B, God still has his events. Among the events are things like when he told Abraham that uh, his descendants would enter the land of Canaan and then they would come up. That's a major event. He even gave a time, time and date. He says 400 years in four generations. So some things God gave times and dates. And then in the book of Daniel, uh, God also gave times and dates to the second coming of Jesus. Uh, to the time when Israel go back as a nation again, uh, and uh, then also uh, to the restoration, return from captivity, and all these are events that have been revealed. So although in this move we have revealed uh, the last uh, week, uh, uh, last week or two, we have revealed the major events that are happening uh, in this last seven and seven years, coinciding with the cycle of the Antichrist. Those those are major events. We have even uh, adopted the calendar of a modern day, uh, giving you deadlines. And those are major things that will not change. The only change is who are involved, how many people are involved. And one event we know, God has answered our prayer, we will have two-thirds of population of the earth. We will reach the population of the earth. Now God showed me two groups of people. And one that will live above the darkness, because you have joined with the OS and one that live below. The one above are fewer than those who are below. Those below are multitudes, but they both belong to the body of Christ. And uh, uh, I'm not the only one who saw this vision. And the other person who saw this vision is actually a, um, a South American lady called Annie. And she wrote it in a book uh, called I Saw the Lord. And it's about three, three or four booklets, and the recent publication combined into one, into a thick book, a compilation of three, four books together. Now, if you're interested, look at the last book, the final book. In the final book, uh, in the earlier book, she saw visions of a group of people who are end time people who live above the darkness of this earth. And uh, the difference is, those who live above, they are, their relationship with God is much deeper. Much, much deeper. But they are fewer in numbers. Then, those uh, who live below the darkness, that means they're easily influenced by that, and, and they are linked to those who are above. Uh, they are strengthened by those who are above, so that they will not go to and fro by every being of doctrine. Uh, and, uh, so they are helped by those above. Their relationship with God is not as deep. But they are more in multitudes. And, uh, so there are these two groups of people in the bride of Christ. You who have come early are trained to be the group that live above. 
so that you're completely unaffected. And uh, all the energies, remember, we are in a process of transference of authority from the angels and from the spirit beings. We are being trained. And it won't finish until the rapture, of course. So we continue to work with angels. But uh, uh, the transference is happening. And the training is happening, which is why we have the pristine universe, the boundary, and all the uh, warring section, and, and each one is trained in different different ways. And uh, so the top 500, and there will be tens of thousands and millions uh, that will live above, and their closeness with God is, is indisputable. I will talk about how to become the top group on the top, and then there is the layer of darkness, and then there are multitudes of those who are. They, they love the Lord still, but their walk with God is not as close. And, and they are the rest of the multitudes who are part of the body of Christ. And they are energized by those who live above. And he has that vision uh, in, the, in the final chapter of a book. She described that. Uh, and, uh, so that's an interesting uh, book to have. Uh, I forgot what her name just says. Annie or something. Uh, she is not the Paraguay. Uh, and that is that. So there is predestination. Uh, that is the general one. Now here, today I'm not talking about the general one. Ooh, yeah. okay, that's fine. It's a big cat. And so these events are more the uh, personal events. That means the events that are in your life. And events that God has planned in our life. So there will be major events that will take place this end time is a very important time and so there will be many events that will flow with the cycle of each one of our life each of our cycles are different and B is a free choice that there is an events plan but whether we will line up with the events or not and we know that people like Judas Iscariot it was God's plan for him to be part of the twelve. But he did not match the event. By the time the book of Acts took place in Acts chapter 1, he was nowhere to be found. And another person called Matthias replaced him. So he did not match the event. By free choice, he chose to go away from God. So B is free choice. And uh, every possible free choice that we have in this life, that can be seen by God. Because God is God and He lives outside the time dimension, for us, our future is like God's past. And our past is finished, our present is still going on, and we still got a future. We still got a future of not that many years actually. We are talking about less than 50 years. Can you imagine? The planet Earth has only approximately about 50 odd years to exist. Only five decades. Five decades is very short. Five decades is very short. And uh, it just passed like that. And can you imagine? The rest of these decades that are coming up, seven times seven years, is going to determine where everybody is going to be in eternity. It's an awesome thing when you think about that. So we have free choice, and since God knows every free choice, God is called God's foreknowledge. So from God's perspective, I keep the ray. There is our perspective is free choice. From God's perspective, is foreknowledge. He foreknew. He knows every decision we will make. Not just generally. He knows the details like uh, uh, which we ourselves do not know. Uh, do you know in 2017 on uh, February the 12th what you will be eating for lunch? God knows. God knows. He knows what choices you're going to make. He knows exactly where you're going to be. So detailed knowledge. God knows our free choice. Which brings us to see, because God knows our foreknowledge, we take it at God's hands off. God is just watching 
the the thing play out. That God is a hands off person. No. Based on foreknowledge of our choice, that we already have free choice, He intervenes. Remember last week I said intervention takes place. But you cannot overdo. Because you overdo, you change everything. So, God has to minimally intervene. Like I talked about, if we have a time machine, you get a time machine and you can travel to the past. If you change the past, you might accidentally wipe yourself out of existence. Uh, so intervention in a timeline is dangerous. However, God in all His full wisdom knows how to intervene in a way so that He intervened based on this principle. Knowing those who will choose Him, He intervenes by giving them a bit of extra help. A bit of extra help. Uh, even before they make the free choice, God starts giving them help. And it looks unfair, but God says, they already make the free choice, I'm just intervening to help them, because these are those who are going to be mine anyway. So I am doing it early for them. Uh, then, for those who do not choose Him and become evil, God intervenes by limiting their ability to affect the innocent. So God limits them. So He chooses to limit and contain evil. So the evil cannot spread and uh, become a plague to destroy the rest of those who are innocent. And uh, sometimes He intervenes in such a way that even at the baby stage, He already intervenes. Like for example, we give the example of uh, Jeroboam, remember. Jeroboam was the one chosen by God to have ten tribes. When Solomon died, Jeroboam was given the northern kingdom. And God promised him, uh, we already touched on this in this series, so I'm not turning back to the scriptures. Uh, God promised him in the, in the book of Kings, First Kings, that he will have a dynasty. In other words, perpetually. Like the southern kingdom will be under David, and David's descendant, he will be his descendant. But it was a conditional promise. And we talk about how when God gives you a destiny that was not your original, we need to absorb our inner DNA so that we can best master it. Because many people think that when they receive anointings, that there are, of, there are, there are a lot of anointings available because there's a lot of failure. Then by just absorbing the anointing, you will succeed. No, you also need to learn how to make it part of your DNA. To succeed. Otherwise, you do not succeed. Like Jeroboam. It was not God's perfect will to split Israel into two kingdoms. But because of free choice, He allowed it. Then Jeroboam, instead of walking with God, walked away from God. He walked away from God. Uh, it keeps coming up. You know, I'm trying to avoid this. It keeps coming up. Okay, let me make this statement. Just a statement. I do an explanation in the, in the time. It's been coming up and I keep refusing to talk about it, but there's pressure from the Spirit. You know, sometimes you know how the Lord wants you to prophesy and say a word and then uh, kind of thing. And, uh, but, um, okay. Whatever has happened thus far was a test. It was a test design that is similar to the test of 2034, 27 to 2034. Where a lot of people would think that the decision that I will be making is for me. It's my mistake and my decision. But it's actually from the Lord. And this recent scenario is the same thing. So now you have a taste of what it can be. Now you have a taste of why people can turn away from the Lord in 2027, 2024, after they see the signs and wonders. Right? You say, after all the signs and wonders, will people still do that? Now you know. Now you know. The way the enemy does it is, number one, by making it associate as it is for me and not from the Lord. And then there will be those who are claiming, this is not from the Lord. 
but the Lord himself said, it is from the Lord. Uh, see, the, the difference is it. Check the downloads. Have I been consistent with the downloads? Don't check anything out. Check the downloads. Have I been obedient to the downloads? That's the first place you should check. Check the voice of the spoken word. And here's the second check. Nothing that has been done has been done just because of my personal revelation. It's been confirmed by three others outside of me. Don't you think that's a very strong witness? When I'm obeying a spoken word, you see, if, if the spoken word only regards myself, it can be my emotions involved. But if three other witnesses, bear witness that that is the road to take, and I take that road, what can you say about the spoken words? You can only say, hey, this is not normal. Hey, this is not tradition. I say, yes, it's not normal. We are not living in normal lives, traditional life. Right? So, the same thing will take place, and it's similar. So, one day we're going to use all these to train people for 2027, 2034. But, this part I'm holding back, but because the seven thunders prophet already prophesied, you really prophesy. There are some whose names will be blotted from the book of life. As we try to prevent it in the first, in, in the real rebellion, in this small little scenario, it is there. I will talk about it when the time comes. But that's the part that Lord wanted to say out. So that some level of the fear of the Lord comes. We are not playing anymore. As I mentioned, we do not have time to play around. We do not have time to compromise holiness. But holiness is sometimes a perception of people. Like for example, people think that sins of the flesh, for example, in the world, uh, and people react to that. But the sin of pride is a greater sin. It crucified Jesus. Uh, when we talk about walking in holiness, they are different. If I had compromised holiness in every way, I would not be able to stand with you in front today. 100%. I have been obedient to the spoken word. You may be easily stumble and misunderstand. But it was a test. It was a test for everyone. Now you know the kind of test it can come for. And it's very easy. Remove God from the picture, show it that it's all just me. And then you can oppose. Because who dare to oppose God directly, correct? That's going to take place in 2027 to 2034. Where they think that it's just a decision that is a personal thing. It will not be. And so now that I've delivered a part, God intervenes. God intervenes, and we look at some of God's intervention. God intervenes by helping those whom He knows will choose Him. And then we're going to talk today about Jonah too. Didn't Jonah choose not to obey. Now, when the, he was thrown out into the sea and the whale swallowed him, was there free choice? His only choice was to die <laughs> and become fish food. Right? Or obey God and become the prophet. So you have a choice. Become fish food, become prophet. What do you choose? Because a prophet. Because a prophet. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be fish food. And uh, so the same way, we're going to explore why God intervened. What allowed God to intervene? Because God sees our free choice. He sees our heart. So that even if our heart is right and we choose the wrong thing because we're under pressure, God still works. He sends the will. 
Although officially it might not be a whale. Uh, the translation just says it's a big fish. A big fish. And uh, Jonah had free choice. He exercised his free choice and said, I don't want to obey. Which we will uh, summarize at the ending that uh, there are three things people don't realize is a privilege. Do you know it's a privilege to discover your predestination? Because there are a lot of people who don't discover it. But discovering it is only step one. Step two, being willing to obey and follow the predestination. That is tough. Because it might not be what we expect. Not, might, might not be what we think. Might not be what we are geared for. Might not be what everybody else wants us to do. Because a lot of people like us to live vicariously for themselves. Alright. Every one of us have to live in honesty to your conscience and to the way that God wants to lead your life. So, being willing to follow our predestination is another level. Then third, even if you follow, to follow your predestination and finish it. Because some people don't finish. They follow part of the way and drop off. I was talking about Jeroboam. After he was chosen, he disobeyed God. And then he has a child. And uh, they're not sure what will happen because the, the, it seems that you know, they are in a situation where they might lose a child. Uh, so Mrs. Jeroboam went back to see the prophet that prophesied the, not the kingdom for him. And she disguised herself, but the prophet knew. And the words of the prophet were, that Jeroboam will die, Mrs. Jeroboam will die, everyone in the family will die, and the child will die. But, the Lord says, there's still some good in the child. So he allowed the child to die and not to be born in the midst of evil. See, what God did was timeline. Let's say, if Jeroboam's child has been born, and then it takes some time before Jeroboam and Mr. Jeroboam and all the evils they, they, they did, might be a few years or you know, some time. Actually, you know, uh, his, his, uh, first, his reign lasted quite a number of years before he was wiped out. If his child has been born and lived those number of years, God might have seen that the child might suffer perhaps like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Still in the end save himself, but a lot unnecessary thing. So God looked at it and said, okay, I'll take the child home now. So that the child will not be exposed to all the evil that is there. That was his intervention. Strange intervention. But God cannot intervene without principle. Without fasting, prayer, and principle. What we're going to discover in this series is what are the principles behind God's intervention. So we can tap on them and flow on them. Uh, then the most important thing is we live and do God's perfect will. So that at the end of the day, every single one of us can say, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. That's what our aim is in the ministry. My aim in the ministry is to teach, to train, so that at the end of those, those who are under our ministry can say these words, I have finished the work you gave me to do. So every one of you is led into your, the perfect will of God for your life. So that's it. So understanding this, I will take A. I will show what happens in A with a new chart. And uh, in A, Let's get the black line now. In predestination, okay, we illustrate with predestination. We know, and this is where we are in the scriptures now. We know that there is, uh, okay, I'm going to have to use, though, because they use A, B, C. So this is A that we're describing. And uh, we know that one, at point one, God predestined us before the foundation of the world. So, before uh, foundation 
of the BFE, before the foundation of the earth. And we know this one is from Ephesians chapter 1. And then we know in Romans chapter 8, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8. Now let's read Romans chapter 8 for a moment. Romans 8. And now, uh, in Romans chapter 8, that just after verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. Inside there, you got one of the principles already. And that is, you must love God. When you love God, you affect point C. C is God's intervention. God will intervene in your life, in your personal life. As long as no matter what happens, you choose and say, I will choose to love God. I will choose to love God. I will choose to love God. And you choose to keep your first love for God. God will keep intervening in everything and make all things work out for good. Important to love God. That is one of the principles to see. Uh, and, uh, to those who are called according to His purpose. Then he says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. The image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are really predestined in Ephesians 1 also, before the foundation of the world, to be in him. So predestination is not just predestined to be successful. Success is automatic. But it's predestined so that we are changed to be more like Christ. That's important. Uh, and, uh, now, to be changed to be more like Christ. Can anyone here be changed without some tribulation? I don't think so. I don't think without sufferings in this life, you can experience the spirit of glory. Even First Peter 5 tells us that when you suffer, you have the spirit of glory come on you. So, in Romans chapter 5, can anyone grow in love without tribulation? No! Can your character be developed? No! So we need hardship. We need suffering to become like Christ. So your predestination includes some tribulation, which is why, not the great tribulation, but the Lord says uh, to His uh, disciples, be of good cheer, for in the world, you will receive tribulation. But be of good cheer. Let the joy of the Lord be in you. So that you can overcome. So it's obvious. To be predestined, to be conformed to Christ, does tell us we will be tested. Now, this is especially for those who are in the category above the dark clouds. If you're going to live above the dark clouds, where they cannot affect you, you're at a certain level where they cannot even come near you. You are like Obed Edom. You are like uh, uh, you are like the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, darkness cannot come you, come near you. You're like the pristine section. Uh, those are the upper sex, upper sections. Then um, there is that test. There is that to be conformed to the image of Christ. While we are in here, turning to the Bible, look at Revelation chapter twenty-one and twenty-two. Uh, and, uh, at the end of the day. This is the finale. We humans always need to look at the goal, to achieve the goal. None of us go to university without determining what course you want to finish. A medical doctor signs up for medical school because they want to be a medical doctor. And when we apply for a job or we tr get trained for a job or, uh, or add skills to our life for a job, we have a goal in mind. Based on that goal, we train ourselves. So the ultimate goal is important to see the ending. I think the Olympics is this year. Already the Olympians who are part of the sports area, which all of us will sometimes probably, depending on what sports you enjoy, you're probably watching some of the Olympic parts of the game. You'll be watching the parts that are of interest to you. And remember, there could be thousands of swimmers 
but they will be cow until a small group left for the Olympic game. They cannot let every Tom Dick and Harry go in. They will take all those who cannot make a certain mark and then they will be the best of the best of the best, maybe the last group of best 12. Then you see the games. Because they're not going to put somebody, otherwise, you know, if any Tom Dick and Harry can go in just because of money, then you've got a group that can, that can run, for example, uh, uh, they can swim so fast, that uh, in, uh, in uh, less than a minute, they finish. And then after that, you see the other guys, they come in. <laughs> no, they don't have time for that. Uh, the only difference between them is a little uh, milliseconds. And uh, the event is finished. Or the 100 meter dash. You know, now it's less than 10 seconds. And you go, and that's that. And uh, I don't know how many of us can run the 100 meter in less than 10 seconds. I, I doubt any one of us are at that stage uh, to do it because and then you might have the event where they go everybody is there and then this guy just starting for the starting line <laughs> because the guy is not supposed to be there so they have to remove all those people and only those who train for that and today they are training the training is so important because just one slight movement different can cost you uh, 0.5 seconds and that could be the difference between a gold medal and no medal. So the training is so specific, there's everything packed to split seconds. And uh, that small little things might affect so much that they measure it so much that, that for some of the swimmers, they even shave all the body hair. <laughs> Just in case they, their hair is like uh, Isau. <laughs> so far, when you see swimming games, have you seen any swimmers with lots of hair all over? <laughs> you know, you know how much hair Isa has? You know, it could almost wrap it like gorilla hair. Have you seen any swimmers with gorilla hair? Oh, <laughs> and he's gonna sit. Those extra hair might cost him about another 30 seconds. And uh, so they do all these little things to win. There's so much, but because they can see the finale, they can see the goal. What is our finale? Our finale is Revelation 21, New Heaven, New Earth. And then he says in verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So New Jerusalem is the bride. And uh, then it tells us here in describing New Jerusalem, it says here in verse 12, Also she had a great high wall with twelve gates, twelve angels at the gates, Names were written on them, on the twelve gates, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. On them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So, some names are there. That is given. Now, let's go back to my little chart here. What is this chart that we are looking at? Point three, you must see point three in your predestination that you're part of New Jerusalem. That is the ultimate. And here is where you apply the predestination and I use a different color. I use a red line again. That is the line that we travel. We were predestined here. We are supposed to be in Christ. And this is our ultimate goal that God wants us to be here. And what consists and brings us into that? All the humans in this life are predestined to be part of New Jerusalem. Now, let's look at the 12 tribes of Israel. They live in the Old Testament. What was their test? What were they to be? And here's where we understand. God always had New Jerusalem in mind. When He designed it, He will pick mankind from every part of the human timeline. Time from 
Adam and Eve to the finale of the human race in our this last 50 years, seven times seven years. He will pick humans from different parts, and you know what we all designed to be? Some of us imagine New Jerusalem. Okay, uh, my drawing is not that good. Imagine New Jerusalem as a big giant city. And so I put glory all the way. And then there are the three gates on each side. And so all the gates they are on each side. The twelve tribes each one of them already have a destiny. Some of them are supposed to be, now this is OT, OT time, let's say OT is here. Some of them in that time are supposed to be here, like uh, like say Reuben, one, two. See, they are all chosen to be that part. Now how will they be? They don't know anything about New Jerusalem. If they live their life exactly according to the book written about them. God is building New Jerusalem even from the Old Testament. And throughout all of human race, when the twelve apostles were chosen, they were part of the twelve foundations. So, okay, let me use a different color. So, they were part of the uh, foundation that is there uh, with all the 12 names uh, down there, the foundation. They were all designed to be different parts. New Jerusalem is not just a building. Yes, it is a type of building, spiritual building. A new heaven, new earth. But it also represents a part of this. And we are all got different parts. Let's turn to looking at our end times today, the book of Revelations, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I know. Okay, Revelation chapter 3. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him, and this is the church age, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He's not talking about the present temple in this old covenant, or in the old covenant, or in this New Testament time, or not even the heavenly temple in heaven. He's talking about New Jerusalem. He's building each one of us to be part of it. And these end times are like the finishing touch. The things that he has chosen the human race all from the time Adam to today. This is the last batch of the humans that is chosen, chosen to be part of that. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. There are many pillars. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from God. And I will run and give my new name. So obviously, this is part of the church age. Now, we were all chosen before the foundation of the earth to be different parts. So let's uh, use a different color. Uh, okay, free choice. Using purple again. So some of us, uh, already the 12 tribes are here, 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 and here. And, uh, and then the other parts around. Then we know the 12 apostles are here, 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 here. There are 12 of them. And uh, then the, we discover the four in the second generation who take the place as the four faces 
uh, like Israel, Jehuda, Abraham, and all that. You know which part they are? They are in here, 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 and here. Now, it's not just for them. Every single one of you have a place in New Jerusalem with your name on it, your personal name. And this we discover, like you could be a brick here in this section, this wall in this section. Or you could be one close to the foundation here. So some of you might say, I like to be there. <laughs> Sorry, that part not your choice. <laughs> That is before we even became alive. In before the foundation of the earth. God already briefed us to be different parts. Then you say, why don't why don't God, you know, straight away bring us through here, through here, and through here straight? And that's the part where there is something that each one of us must experience and bring into New Jerusalem. You say, what is that? Because New Jerusalem represents the throne room. The throne room represents the attributes of God. And that's why I talk about the fourth level of holiness, which is personification. That God wants every one of you to become a specific attribute of God. So some of you might think, wow, personification of wisdom already gone, you already took it. <laughs> there are a million different types of wisdom. Not finished yet. Why do you think God's so small? <laughs> there are lots of it. And by the grace of God, I've seen a lot of the dimensions. There are a lot of things I can't share. I wish I could share. I want to share. But need the people to grow up to that level. Then you can talk about some of the mysteries. I've seen things beyond New Jerusalem. Seen things beyond that. And I wish that I could have someone to talk to about that. Ah no. But we all must discover our predestination first. Discover your destiny. Then number two is you must be willing to accept your destiny. Because it might not turn out the way you want. Let me give an example. Aruel is a good example. When Aruel first discovered he is on the ox section, he said, I actually like the girl. <laughs> Remember that? But he was shown as the ox section. Then later on he discovered that Michael the archangel was also the ox section. So, Okay, no problem. His middle name is Michael. And then he discovered that in the hierarchy of God, he is number two under Jehuda in the church. At that time, we don't have four plus four. Even uh, with, the, uh, with the three of them, he is number two. God chose Jehuda to be number one. Uh, when, when I go off and finish in 2016, Jehuda is a takeover together with the four and the twelve. Um, so when he discovered, all right, he says, Oh, okay. And you and you see his earlier downloads, he was just struggling, he said, Wow, he has this amount of power, massive power like Michael the Archangel. And then God made him number two. Because God wants to show that that is how humility works. So he went through the struggle, then he accept, he accept his position and call. And so that, you know, recently we were discussing, sometimes he write to me and say, I want to pray for this person, this person had cancer, agree with me, pray for, pray for, pray for all these things. And uh, then recently, uh, uh, he sent me a, uh, 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 something about, you know, whether, you know, somebody is, is around or somebody is dying or something that's dead, uh, uh, whether, you know, we should go and raise the dead. So I prayed, and then I said, uh, 
Now, uh, I don't think this is the one. Uh, I know we were raised today, but I said I don't think this is the one. Uh, and, uh, and so I give all the he he give me the Bible and you know, all, I also explain the Bible. I explain my new all these things, my new plan, new night, and all this, and then we discuss things like Mark sixteen all that. And then I mention this. Raising the date is not in Mark 16 or Matthew chapter 28. Raising the date is only in Matthew 10, Luke 9. And to some extent, the 70 are given. It's a special commission. And raising the date is not under normal healing because it takes a different category. And so I said, uh, God did not say in Mark 16, and they shall go and raise the date. If he did, then everyone can do it. Neither is it in James chapter 5. What well, healing is in James chapter 5. So I said, to raise someone from the dead, you must hear a rhema. And I said, we cannot make mistakes in that area. That means if you go and raise the dead, you know the dead will be raised. Uh, no tikam tikam. Yeah. And then you go there and hey, yeah. tikam back or whatever. So, uh, so uh, you know, in the end, after praying about it, then I wrote him another email and I said, However, because I love you and I love you to exercise your free choice, even though I say, okay, this is not it, but if you feel that you still want to, no problem for me. Uh, so but I say, you need to make sure that the results are positive. That's all. Then he wrote to me and said, and he wrote about four points or four, five points. Says, he says, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man under submission. As long as you, I don't get your agreement, uh, I will not go forward. And uh, so he said, I remain a man under authority. And, and he gave two different, two, three other points in terms of the flow, the order, and what God is doing. I thought that was very good of you, Abraham. That was, that was good. Because that uh, is where he has accepted, and Abraham is like from the army background. He says, once he knows where his position is in the army, he knows where to take orders. So, discovering your destiny is one. Accepting your place. Because a lot of people don't know how to accept their place. And, uh, it took me a while to accept my place to be the lead. It took me a while. As you know, I'm not someone who covered positions. I'm not someone who likes attention. Uh, it's opposite for me and uh, that's why when other people for five four I always say okay you do your job you do your job even though like which I sometimes I train some of the young ones and I was uh, speaking to one of the twelve uh, and I said you know learn from me you can exercise authority without being authoritative if people have to feel your authority it might be not the best so I'll give you a few examples I talk about how, you know, uh, I always reason with people. I always uh, uh, sit down and say, okay, let's talk about it. Let's reason it out. Let's see why, which is right, which is wrong. Now, from the army perspective, I could say, okay, just do this. Correct? I don't need to give explanation. But my style is democratic. I always want to sit down and say, okay, let me hear all your points. Let me see this thing. And then if you also will hear my points and see why this is the way. So I love to reason uh, and so that people are persuaded with good reasoning and sound sense rather than just telling them what to do. So which is what we are training people and training leaders. Because we got enough of leaders being like a military commander. And uh, who say, you know, when I tell you to jump, you know, you cannot ask me any question. The only question you can ask is how high you want me to jump. Right. So I say, no, 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 that's not our style. When we ask you to jump, you should ask, why should I jump? Give me good reasons why I should jump. And then when we give you the good reasons, you will keep jumping because you know the reasons. Rather than you're jumping because I asked you to jump. So you jump on your own accord. And uh, so uh, different things that we need. Uh, to understand about this different aspect. But where we are today is we have discovered 
that even though the individuals can live here, 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 we all live different lives here, every single life is tied to some part of New Jerusalem. Can you see? And a lot of us in this end times, in this end time part, your life is tied to different parts of the building. God is actually completing the building. You can see the excitement of the angel. They are completing the building because by now, so many parts have finished. Now you know why the twelve apostles, when, when the twelve patriarchs live and die, go finish the doors, the gates. Uh, and, uh, then when uh, the twelve apostles live and die, go finish the foundation. Can you see that? And Paul's name was, is also somewhere there, but I won't tell you where it is. I saw Paul's name. But it's a different part, a very important part. Very important part. And it, and it shows who he is. Your position or where your name is. It's very important. And uh, that one, not free choice. That's why I put it under A, under predestination. So some of you might complain. Ah, oh, Pastor, why am I just a doorknob? <laughs> hey, a doorknob, very important. Remember, even David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be anywhere else. You are talking about positions highest in all God's creation. Even the doorknob in New Jerusalem is higher than the highest spirit beings and spiritual beings and nature. Those are positions that form the true root of God. It's a privilege even to be one of the tiny little bricks over here. What a privilege! Which is what Satan would have loved to come with. But it was not meant for him. It was meant for the human race. Which explains why even those of you in the first generation even you live and die and finish your work, which is why I said that you are still part of New Jerusalem. Because when you finish your life successfully, obeying what God's perfect will in your life, you will, upon completion of your life on earth, you will contribute to one part of it. Shall I do what? Okay. Then the Lord allow me to give this part of revelation. A lot of you in the top 500 and top, you know, a million or so are part of the upper portions here. Synchronized with the capstone, the finishing touches of New Jerusalem. Important rules. While the apostles are the foundation, you all are part of the capstone, the crown. What a privilege. So the training is tough. That's why God demands on that. But I need to cover one more point before we finish it in the second service. That is B, which is very important. Let's go to B, done. Go back to the old diagram. Okay. We have covered this area of predestination, revealing that. Oh, you cannot write on this screen. Okay. We have finished this part. Now, in free choice, apparently, as you keep choosing the right thing and make your free choice, God, by His intervention, based on your free choice, uses the concept of what I call marking and sealing. Marking and sealing into your predestination. See, when Judas is carried, as I mentioned, first started, when God, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus came down for all night prayer, and then he chose the twelve. Already when they were named, he put, and Judas is carried who betrayed him. Well, he haven't even betrayed, it was like, the revelation was that. Uh, he was a son of perdition. That, that was going to happen. That was a foreknowledge revelation. He was still safe. He was still okay. Perhaps even up to 
Luke 9 and Matthew 10. When Jesus sent them two by two. Remember Jesus sent them two by two? Judas Iscariot was with them. Up to that time, he might still be safe. But at some point, between Luke 9 and Matthew 10, to the Lord's Supper, some point between that, in the last year of Jesus' ministry, maybe even in the last few months before Jesus' ministry ended, he lost his salvation. He opened the door for the devil to come. By the time the Lord's Supper took place, when Jesus gave him the piece of bread to identify him as the one who betrayed him, it says in the Gospel of John, the devil entered into him. That one got salvation. Right? So we ask this question, what causes it and what is happening? While for some other people like Jonah, they actually walk away from God and God brought them back. What's happening here? It has to do with this understanding and the doctrine of what I call the mark or the seal. See, when we talk about the mark, many of us think about the mark as uh, the enemy, correct? The enemy's mark. Let me show you that God also marked His people. God marked His people. And... Uh, you find in the book of Ezekiel an interesting thing here. Book of Ezekiel. It says here in uh, Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Now, Ezekiel was prophesying about a destruction that will come on the city of Jerusalem. And there are people who live in the city of Jerusalem. And in that time, yeah, I'm struggling with two things here because there's a download on healing and it's also well, one of you here is sitting in the middle section here you have some sort of uh, limb gland swelling and lung that is that uh, and uh, afterward you know come and we anoint you and we heal uh, and some minor condition with another lady with uh, your shoulder you come go will heal you straight away now in Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 the Lord said to Ezekiel Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done with it. And then he continues saying, in verse, uh, then in verse 5, To the others he said in my hearing. Let me see, he's only hearing. You don't see, actually, Ezekiel never went and put a mark. He saw the Lord speaking to someone or some angel who had the ability to mark people for him. And then he says it was fine. Go after him to the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay the old, the young, the maidens, the little children, the women. But do not come near anyone in whom is the mark. Is this a good mark or bad mark? Good mark. Because while everybody is slaughtered, God already marked who will, who will survive. Who will not die. It is God marking the people. Now, this is not the only place. You see that taking place in the book of Revelations when uh, during the time of the tribulation, which is a horrible time, in the time of the tribulation, there will be, uh, in the release of death and uh, all these horrible things that happen on the earth, and you see the, well, by the second horse you got war and uh, all these things taking place. But he says in verse 6, I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Then the voice says, Do not harm the oil and the wine. Do not harm the oil and the wine. What is he talking about? He's not talking about natural things. He's talking about those who have 
the Holy Spirit in their life and those who have the power of God in their life which is the wine see the wine represents uh, the power of God where Jesus turned the water into wine uh, it's, a, it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit one of the manifestations of the power say so don't touch people who have the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit on their life they are Mark and we all know these uh, scriptures very well in chapter 7 of Revelations there's an angel and he has the seal of God now the word seal is pragis a signet in other words is like a mark what seal is like a, it's a mark that is there and now uh, okay let me put get more results yeah there the seal of God that is there and then all the hundred and forty four thousand are sealed in other words they put a mark on that is why the 144,000 cannot be killed. They cannot be killed not because of their own cleverness. Not because they know routes of escape. Not because of anything. They cannot be killed because the mark of God was on their life. God marked them. And that's not the only place where God uh, sealed all these people. And then we see in uh, Revelation chapter uh, 9 verse 4 Revelation 9 verse 4 says they were commanded now these are the demons and the fallen angels God sent a command to the fallen angels as he does in the tribulation he even does today do you know the command given to Satan and the fallen angels same thing do not come near those who have the mark of God. Remember God also told Satan, do not take his life. When God allows certain things, Job did suffer. But God said, don't take his life. See, God puts a stop to different things. And He says, they were commanded, hey, the bad guys, the worst of the worst, the filth of evil, was told, do not harm the grass or green tree or any tree, but only those who do not have, do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Can you see that? The mark. And of course, we all know that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit uh, in Ephesians. We all have been sealed. We receive the seal. While people talk about the mark of the Antichrist, today let me talk about the mark of God. I know that in 1986, when Jesus appeared to me on January 17, 18, uh, and then on the next day after he appeared to me, now one week before he appeared, the four, and there was a fallen angel appear. Exactly one week before. It's like Satan knew something was happening. Then the next week, Jesus appeared, and then after he appeared, then you know it was right up to the morning. Then if the anointing was so strong, I didn't sleep at all. Then in the early hours of the morning of the 18th, I saw a ball of light come into my bedroom. Then the ball of light changed to the words "Holiness unto the Lord." Then those words came and I described it in my vision and it hit me and touched me on the forehead. The moment it touched me on the forehead, I was taken up into the spirit and it was where I experienced the love of God. And I thought about that experience of the love of God where you could feel every, every sparrow that dropped to the ground and died. You could feel any pain on the earth and it was so great that I, I couldn't even uh, continue long uh, to suffer the pain of love that God felt all those things so I described that from that day onward there's a mark on my forehead that says holiness unto the Lord in the spirit I was marked now 
many of you have already been marked and sealed. But there are different levels of marking and sealing. As God impart different things. It is important to have the mark of God. I think when I was fellowshipping with Aaron, Aaron told me that even sometime back or something, he said about how the evil power says, oh, this person belongs to God. Remember that? They recognize something on him. Even before, before you came to Jesus, right? Before you came to Jesus. And the enemy or the tokun tokun what? They say, the evil spirit say, this one don't belong to us. See, they are only allowed to harm those who do not have the seal. Now remember to the church of Philadelphia, God will write for you. Philadelphia is the spirit of wisdom. As we grow from peace, love, glory, power, life, wisdom, we grow to the stage where the mark of God in our life increases to the extent that when you reach a certain level where you will never, you will never ever go astray again. And that explains why Jonah never could run away. You know what gave God the authority? The mark. The mark. Sometimes when do God mark us? I was marked from the day I was born. Although predestined, and uh, my family told me some stories that I don't quite recall. I think uh, some of you also had interesting stories. Uh, Colin's New Dictionary, right? You told me about how when you were born, is it when you were born? In the womb. While you were in the womb, his mother, who never see visions and all the things, saw two angels. Four angels, four nines and four angels. His mother, who never see visions, See four angels. Now some of you say, oh, yeah, why I don't have all these things? <laughs> why was I abandoned child? You know, pick up for the rubbish bit. No, 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 no. You just didn't know yet. You just don't know yet. If you're part of this move, I can assure you, even when you're conceived in a womb, the mark was there. And that mark represents this. God's intervention based on all knowledge. Can you see him marking different people? And sometimes he marks, let's say in his end time, he marks several times. Each arrow represents a mark upon the life. Then mark that we receive, the ceiling that we got received is important. Because as layer as layer comes upon our life, you reach a point, like I said, this revival has reached a point where nothing can stop it. We're way past certain things. And anyone who tries to stop it will be executed by Archangel Uriel. Only in his mercy of God is Archangel Uriel restrained from exercising it. But the seven thunders prophet had prophesied. We haven't re released the prophecy yet uh, in public, but between us is really released in the spirit. And in that prophecy, our angel Uriel is going forth and he is executing those who oppose them. Of course, some people say, I know, everyone, you know, well, this church, uh, join very dangerous, leave also dangerous. <laughs> Don't know to join to me. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about that. Yeah. You know. By all means, grief is easy. You know, just live properly. Right? That's it. And then, then do, do no harm. Do, do no evil. That's it. You know. And we promise you one thing, you know. You will never hear from the pulpit any personal judgment or prophecy. When we give, it's always general. We just say, okay, this is the download. That is that. Uh, we've learned lessons from uh, our past, where a couple of years ago, uh, there were some very personal judgment prophecies, not given to me, but you know, given by the old Seven Thunders prophet. And again, I say, I believe that was a mistake. Yeah. 
uh, general prophecies we can give, but personal prophecies must be given personally. Uh, not for the rest to know. Now, however, prophecies must be delivered. Must be delivered. So, and so sometimes we use certain things as part illustration or teaching so that we're aware of the whole scenario. And as you can see, I struggle when I want to talk about the things of judgment because it's opposing to my nature. That's why God split the whole ministry into different things. I represent Melchizedek, the blessing. The seven thunders, however, that's the ruler of is permitted and allowed to pronounce judgment on, uh, in a general scale. But he's a man under authority, so he'll be carried correctly. And it's the work and the job of the seven thunders to announce judgment on uh, part of the prophet's role. So those of you who aspire to be prophets, good on you. <laughs> okay, and that's your job. And uh, so I can stand in the office of prophet from time to time, but only where there is an absence of one that God can find. Otherwise, I perform my role uh, as an apostle, or voice of Christ, at midnight, right hand of God, other things. Oh, now can see that. But it's important for us to know God's great mercy on our life. God is not in the business of destroying a person. God is in the business of restoring people. God is in the business of helping people not to lose their destiny. God is in the business of helping people not to fall. And, but those things do happen. And uh, we pray that it be minimalized. Uh, so knowing that God is putting this mark on each one of our lives, and He put a mark on each one of us, we need to know as we conclude, what are the things that help us to increase the mark on our life? And we already saw first love is one. First love is one. But notice the reason why God put a mark on those who uh, in Ezekiel's time, remember what he said? Those who cry out against the evil and the abominations are, are all these things. And uh, so, you know, they're not talking about natural things. You see, if you really think, if you really think that I've seen or I've done things, it is not your job to remove me. It is your job to pray for me. Uh, no. Then uh, it is it is important for us to understand that we are to intercede and pray rather than take natural rules of action. By the time you take natural rule action, check in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, have any of the people of God with the exception of them going to war in the land of Canaan, make use of natural things to bring forth righteousness. No. They have always asked God to bring forth righteousness. The bad people are the ones who will side with the Roman Empire and side with the political people. You see, the Jews, when they don't want Jesus, you know what they do? They already ostracize anybody who believe in Jesus, correct? They use the temple soldiers and they use the, the power of the Roman Emperor to crucify Jesus. Didn't they do that? When we lean on the arm of the flesh, we are no more spiritual people. About five years or ten years ago, there was a move by evangelical Christians to get involved in politics. There are pastors resigning to stand for election and all those things, you know, the past 10, 15 years. And it's like the evangelical movement start, suddenly became very political. Then as a church, and as a leader in the church, I always tell people, I say, look, the church must always remain apolitical. That means we are not a political organization and we must not get involved in politics. We must take a neutral stand. People can have their political views, but the church must be non-political and let people have their future. Because these are the affairs of this earth, which Jesus is not interested in. 
and and although it's important to us affect our lives, we should not be getting involved. Unless, of course, you got a call of God to those areas. Okay, exception. There's a call to those areas. Outside of that, instead of using uh, campaigning uh, and then protests in order to change this world, you know what is our best guide? On our knees. We use prayer and fasting. We will not use the arm of the flesh to change things. We will not use armies or weapons of war in the natural. We will not use the weapons of the Roman Empire. But we will use spiritual weapons. Which is, don't you think fasting and prayer are more powerful than all the armies of the world? spiritual weapon. So it's important that we fast and we pray. And that's it. Our main weapons are spiritual. And then, as we always say, let God be the judge. Let Him show. Already in downloads, God, Jesus Himself is said, I will show who is wrong and who is right. So we just pray. And God will show. And as He shows, then we will be able to teach. To say, why is this and why is that? Uh, because for all of us, we want as many people as possible not to fall, but to walk in that move of God. Number one, first love. Number two, have a heart of prayer. Prayerful people are not going to fall. Those people that he talked about in Ezekiel are those who cry out, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Sin is all around. The abominations, idolatry is happening. Isn't Elijah the same way? He was one of the intercessors. And I believe God marked him when he interceded. Once God marked him, you know what happened? The angels start paying attention. The angels will say, watch this man. And then if this man reach another level, give him another mark. And give him another mark. Until that man became crowned. Quote unquote crowned. The mark was so strong it became a crown. Where angels will obey the words that he prophesied. When he spoke, fire, fire came down. Sometimes he didn't even call down fire. He walked so close with God that he became a marked man. A marked man in a good way. God marked him. Remember I talked about the face of God shining on him. So when the soldiers came to arrest him, and they, and they were very rude to him, and they very rude to him and said, you know, Men of God, come down! We order you! Because they're soldiers. And then Elijah said, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and can see you. That's it. He didn't even have long prayer, didn't have been an altar, anything like he did in First Kings 19. Just a simple word, and that's it. Which brings us to this thing. The higher your spiritual position is, the more love we must have. Otherwise, we accidentally say the wrong thing. And it becomes a judgment on people. Which is why the training is very, very exquisite and detailed and thorough. So that progression in God is measured by the currency of love. It's not just currency or how, how intellectual you are. That doctrine is always important. By the end of the day, as I always say, end of the day is how much love we have. How much love we have to handle things. And remember this. If any one of you fall, any one of you fail in any area, I promise to deal with you all with love. That's my promise to you. Find a way to help you. From now till the end of time, when time ends. And in my past, I have dealt with many, many people under my leadership who fail in different ways. Not one time did not I deal with love. Without love. Each time it was compassion, helping, to restore. For love covers a multitude of sin. So remember this. As I say, like Deborah says, you know, I'm not perfect yet. 
deal with me with love. If you love me, is this how you deal with things? I. Uh, so, as like I said, let's have a two-way relationship. If I deal with you with love, can you not deal with me with love? That is where you, this you can discover who are truly people who are loving for people who are not. And when do we understand love? In crisis, in tough times. And put it this way, from now till we grow, there will be times when we agree and disagree. Say, hey, I don't understand this. Yeah, you know. Hey, disagree to this. I say, fine. Let's walk in this manner. Because doctrines are still being revealed. Mysteries are still being unveiled. And it's important that we let prayer be our resource. Prayer. And you pray, sure. God will show himself. God will show who is right, who is wrong. Why? God is not dead. He is still sitting and he's the judge. And he's the best judge. Because he can see everything in the heart. Every delight. And he is a compassionate judge. And he's a loving judge. Who sees us to help us. Number one, first love. Number one, prayer and fasting. Number three, you have the oil and the wine. Remember he said, do not touch the oil and the wine. It's because you got the level of the spirit. What makes the difference between the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins? Extra oil. Extra oil. So when you're a man or woman of the spirit, not a man or woman of the intellect alone, not a man or woman of authority, not a man or a woman who can, you know, uh, uh, feel different things. You're a man or woman of the spirit. And what is the spirit? What is the greatest flow of the spirit? The spirit of peace, love, glory, power, life, wisdom, mercy. Do you notice the fruit? What is so powerful that no law can go against? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. Against such, don't forget the last part, against such, there is no law. Because it's the law of the Spirit of life. What frees us from the law of sin and death? A new set of righteousness? A new set of this is right, this is wrong? No, no, no. What frees us from the law of sin and death? Is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that spirit of life, what's behind life? Love. What's behind love? The light of God. And the true light of God. So, number three, have the oil and the wine. And if you remember in our downloads on the rebellion in 2034, 2027, 2030, the Lord Himself says, you can go and read it back. I mean, it's put at the appendix of my uh, autobiography. The Lord says, because the anointing is on the 500, it stops them from being too deceived by the fallen angel. So it was a protective layer. The anointing that God has given is a protective layer that preserves us from being deceived by the end. We'll talk more of this and then we'll analyze Jonah and have all the benefits of the mark of God on our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We know, Father, that it's by your grace we stand. Not a single one of us can claim to be able to stand in our own righteousness. For we all stand by your grace. And by your grace alone, and not of works lest any man should boast. We stand by your grace. We stand by the righteousness of Jesus and not by our own righteousness. Like Paul, who has lived a fantastic life in his ministry, he says in the book of Philippians that 
He count all things lost or as done compared to the knowledge of Christ and that he be found not having his own righteousness but that he be found having the righteousness of Christ. So we pray, Father, that we will all rise to the fact that him that is forgiven much, loveth much. We thank you, Father, for only you can cause us to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. When we know ourselves, we know where we all came from, we know what we truly have done or haven't done, we all know that you know all things. So we ask, oh Father God, that you put a mark on each one in each life. Please, oh Father, mark your people, those whom you have chosen, so that they will never go astray from you. That there will be some strings of your love pulling them back every time they want to go the wrong direction, the wrong way, in your heart or in your mind. We ask, oh Lord, that in this move, that your angels continue to take the spiritual ink and mark the foreheads, the minds of each one. We pray that your church here at COG Worldwide will grow into the Philadelphia church. The church of brotherly love. So only in that level, at that church, can we have your name and the name of God and the name of Jerusalem written on our foreheads. And we truly are sealed, even while on earth, to become New Jerusalem, while living on earth. It's a privilege that you had never given to any people before that, not in the Old Testament, and only revealed in the New Testament. So we thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that you established in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It is a good time, our friends. God bless you.